Disclaimer, we'd like to note before the start of this interview that the opinions about to be expressed by the guest on tonight's Get and Sell at the Experience podcast are that of the guest and do not directly or necessarily reflect the views of the host of the Get and Salty Experience podcast. You're listening to the Get and Salty Experience podcast. Hello. Peters, She's I'm there. in Chicago. Peters, Peters, Peterson. <laughs> I think uh, Steve Steve Lockett is in the chat too. I saw before. Sam, oh, 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 let me see. Let me go back a little bit. And see if I catch him in there. We got William. Oh, oh yes, Ray, right here. Boom, oh, we'll let. Hey all. Oh, he has a beer, sir. Just so you know, he's boy. already ready. To go. <laughs> Sonny boy. Giving us the whole story. I already wow. apologized to your mother when Coop starts throwing the F-bombs already. So, uh... Oh, was she listening? I'll reserve the F-bombs, Mrs. Lockett. We'll right. throw the red flag. I got the uh, clean it up. The instant replay flag. So if we need exactly. to instant replay something. Replay. Oh, yeah, right. You see that no. commercial, the instant replay? Should we yeah. get the flag? Right. Like, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, you throw that all you want. All right. yeah. Well, you know, it may, it may come in handy. I don't know. Interesting I mean, week, man. Tough, tough week. Interesting week. The ship crashing into the uh, Francis Key Scott Bridge there. Uh, that was insane, wasn't it? Yeah, I told you I have the uh, – here's a map in case you guys wanted to see a map of where it was. We oh, were no. saying in the pre-show, like, uh, the, the ship dwarfs the bridge. That's yeah, how yeah. it, like – and Ray was saying, yeah, it looks like an erector set on there. It looks like a yeah. little – it's just incredible that they let that thing go through there without uh well it lost control. No, no, I understand that, but I mean you gotta realize that that how many times have we had ships do something stupid from you know guys drinking or whatever? They they shouldn't be able to just come in and out of there and they're yeah. I mean, look I at that they thing. found the other guys, the other workers, right? Two of them. Last I heard they only found two. Yeah. Those guys were in the car, Ray was saying. Yeah, the guy <clears> in the <throat> truck or something, right? Oh, were they in a truck? Holy crap. Those are the guys, those are the cars that were the only ones left on the bridge. If you when you saw it fall, there was a couple of things, and I guess yeah. Well, they let that they they radioed ahead saying that yeah. they had no control of the ship and they shut down the bridge. Can you imagine? It was like during rush hour or something. Holy shit! Yeah, that's what Ray was and, saying. Seven, you know, he's been going over that bridge for a lot of years. He was saying that they get like a ridiculous amount of cars going at. Yeah. Now the traffic that that's like one of the main arteries there too, like. You have to go all the way around now. I don't know. That's, all this. Uh, that's why I pulled up the map to show you how. But that, well, you're 100 percent right. It's Louis you know, would love to do all the work for that, bro. Right? <laughs> Every day now, you had to take take a different way to work. You'd be. <laughs> yeah. oh, I got oh, chest God. pains already. Oh, take, take it <laughs> easy. Oh, take your medicine. Take your medicine. Take it easy. Okay, I took take it. Take it easy. Take, take it easy. Take, take it easy it over here. You're tough. You got a debilitated ticket. There. I don't want anything to happen. You know what I mean? <laughs> He's good though. Everything's roto rooted, bro. He's good. I come better than I was. Oh, there is some good news, right, Guns? We fi- it's finally in the air. It's finally oh. on its way. Oh yeah. Are yeah. you ready? For- Are you ready yeah. for it? Oh, here we go. Boom! Oh, there it is. There it is. Finally on its way. Oh. Ah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Pizza cutter. Good God, help me. Yep. We're Looks gonna good. See. We're gonna sell out in no time. Ruby's gonna say, you know what? I should have listened to that a hole weeks ago, months you ago. Know. What would be great if we could pull the ripcord for real? Oh, <laughs> I didn't even think of that. Gonzo. <laughs> Take it easy. I know. What's the matter with you? You know, they can put like little sound effects in there too. Like when you're rolling it, you have... Oh, man. Okay, and then... Now you're pushing it. Now you put... Take it easy. That would be great, wouldn't it? How funny is, is Mikey Cologne with the with the whole uh, getting on the EMS over there? Like, oh, oh, oh man. I thought it was for it, bro. Just <laughs> fly for the EMS? What? Yeah. Earn money yeah. sleeping? Did you say earn money sleeping? That's I want to EMS doing. stories. I'm like, Mike. He's taking steps. See, let him get his EMT, run the bus for a while, whatever you do. It's doing. like, yeah, there was, uh, we, this was the job, uh, Lou, that we had in, uh, you know, it was around on the Charlie side. I'm like, all right, take it easy. <laughs> take it easy. <laughs> Let's start throwing out exposures just yet. You're just oh, you're so. talking about it. The tone's dropped. <laughs> 
<laughs> where is he? Does he say anything in the chat? Because you know he's listening. Just, uh, just, hello. Hey, hello. He said hello, but yeah, he's just there. Uh, but yeah, it's easy with the tones to drop in and Charlie side and all this. I said, stuff. imagine what he gets if he starts riding the buses in EMT. What did I tell oh, him? There I was. Lou, when I tell him what the most low, important thing. Low glycemic, Lou. I, ha- <laughs> I didn't know what to glycemic. do. I didn't know what to do. I went right palpate. There. You got to palpate. Pop, and everything was fine. <laughs> palpate. Take this call. I'm riding the back step. And uh, we're going on a uh, cardiac. <laughs> you know, I'm giving, I'm giving it compressions. I'm compressing. I'm compressing. And Ruffy and always him. says, I'm bagging him. I'm bagging him. I'm bagging, I'm bagging him. him. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. Love dub, Ruffy dub, always dub, says, dub, love dub. dub. <laughs> what does Ruffy always say? Stay, Stay away from the light, little buddy. Light, little buddy. That's what we told him. That's all you got to remember, bro. That's it. <laughs> I love that kid. Uh, he's a good kid. I tell him he's like my son. Oh, he's he's my young enough to be my son. I tell you, when he's talking, you could see how, like, exact he is. Like he's really yeah. uh, kind of he's, he's he's very, very uh, focused. I guess would be mm. the word. He's focused on what he wants to say, and he'll wait. Well, we busted his balls, but he'll wait to yeah. be all serious, prim and proper. You know, tie the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen. Tomorrow we got a quick little video coming out i'm stepping my toe into the editing realm and i edited a little piece so tomorrow will be showing up it's only four minutes share it's one that you can share so share it around send it around will you send it this way yeah send, send it that it. way all right listen we got to get the commercials because we, yes, we only we had one show this week so uh let's get Ooh. the commercials out of the way so we can get my man mr ray back I'll lock it in here no, All you right. lock it up. No, you lock it up. No, you, you lock, lock it up. No, you lock it up. Look at me back there chuckling. All right, here we go. <laughs> Armor Tough Firehouse Flooring was recently installed in station number seven, the newest of the DeKalb County Fire Stations in Decatur, Georgia. Meeting Deputy Chief Smith of Support Services, Vince explained that Armor Tough Interlocking Flooring is the only floor that is tough enough to withstand the abuse of fire apparatus, along with fire personnel at a very busy station. Chief Smith explained, The flooring in all of our stations over the years gave us multiple problems. We need a floor that can last as long as the walls and the roof. That's why we chose Armor Tough. The installation team came from New Jersey and in three days, they had completed their work without any disruption to our daily operations. We were very impressed with not only the product, but with the workmanship as well. I highly recommend Armor Tough for your station's floor. Call Vince today for a no obligation quote at 908-917-7697. That Vin, we'll see Vin on two weeks. I think when we go to Indy, right? Yeah, I, I play the second one. So we we lock it. No, you lock it up. Lock you lock it, it up. Here we go. Established in 1930 and under the current ownership since 1987, the New Jersey Fire Equipment Company handles a complete line of fire department equipment and supplies. Headquartered in Greenbrook, the company operates full 3M Scott service facilities in Ridgefield Park and Toms River, staffed by 10 fully authorized Scott certified technicians with a fleet of six fully equipped service vans. All New Jersey fire technicians and sales representatives are active or retired firefighters, officers or chief officers, career and volunteer. They understand the business and the importance of their work. New Jersey Fire has represented Scott since Earl Scott entered the SCBA business at the end of World War II. Among other leading manufacturers represented by New Jersey Fire are Globe and Firedex Turnout Gear, Mercedes Hose, Task Force Tips and Akron Brass, Hygenol, Fire Hooks, Arctic Compressors, MSA Carnes Helmets, ChemGuard Foam, Alkalite and Duo Safety Ladders, BA Face Shield Protectors, Truckman's Choice Saws, Groves gear racks and washer dryers, SuperVac fans, RPI, Streamlight, and many others. A New Jersey incorporated and based company, sales and service are limited to the state of New Jersey. Find us now at www.njfe.com. That's www.njfe.com. Sweet. Don't forget to tune in Monday, me, Ruffy. Big reveal show. We got something big to announce on Monday. So That's pretty sure big, you, actually. It, it is big. big. Big announcement. Tune in. Tell your friends. Tell your friends. Tell your friends. All right, let's get him in. Ruffy, you bring him in. 
All right, so we've had a couple guys from Baltimore City, some legends, and those guys talked about this guy. Is that how that worked? Oh, yeah. Oh, like, so he's the, the uh, is the goat. Uh, yeah, did my goat work? It didn't work. Let me no. try it again. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I don't know. No, I'm, I'm no, lobbing no, that beach ahead. ball up for you, for God's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. I, I gotta see what's up with my shit here. Yeah, it's not. Oh, it's Thursday. The cleaning people are there. So. <laughs> <laughs> I tell us not to put my laptops down. Take it easy. Take laptop. it easy. All right. Come to the stage. Go, From Baltimore City FD. Ray Lockett. Lock it up. Ooh. Lock it up. Hey, lock it up. Mr. Ray, welcome. Oh, well, you lock it up. We've got a picture of a scary part of behind the body. I'm already scared. No time to do it. Up up up, my man. You know what? Before we get up, we forgot the pledge last time. So let's get in there. Let's not forget it. We cannot be. Uh, Ooh, we did see with the we way things are going uh, yeah. as well. Yeah. Yep. All right. Here we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's Absolutely. Say shalom. Shabbat shalom. That's Shabbat tomorrow. Shalom from That's tomorrow. tomorrow. Welcome to the show, Mr. Lockett. Thank you. Good to be here. Good to be looks here. Good. He looks good, that guy, huh? 23 years retired, Coops. How many years? Two, three. Oh, yeah. man. I hope I make 23 years retired. Yeah, right now. Right. Well, the guy got on but not too far after we were born. I don't want to give his age away, but I'm just going <laughs> to I, mean, I, I think Lockett invented the pop and Lockett dance, break dance thing back in the day. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Coops started with that. He used to carry like a roll of linoleum around with him. <laughs> I used to carry a cardboard box, but you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, squirrel moment. <laughs> I already have this answer on my very look at this detailed. I tell you, one of the timeline. best uh, timelines I got. I have yeah. to you know, back, let, let's let's dive into the early days of Mister Lockett. Where'd you grow up? Give us a little early history of the days when you were young. What were you into before you got into the fire service, and how did you get into the fire service? Well, I grew up in Baltimore City. I uh, lived there for forty-seven years. I grew up in a uh, blue collar, poor neighborhood. Um, never had any intentions of going in the fire department. I was in, uh, seemed to get in too much trouble and just drinking too much and fighting too much and just having a, having a good time. <laughs> never had any intentions of going in the fire department. Uh, and my mother in law, whose husband was, Killed in the line of duty. He was a Baltimore City firefighter. He got killed in 1961 when my wife to be was 13 years old. Oh wow! And uh, I met her when she was 15, and we never discussed her father. And I went in the army for three years. Came home, started dating again, and got married to her. And for four years, I was going from job to job. I was a brakeman on a railroad, I hung sheetrock, I was a security guard, I was a truck driver. And I'm sure her mother was getting tired of seeing her only daughter being married to a guy with no direction to his life. Like, listen, Ray, Ray, you had to up the game here a little bit. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> so in, uh, after we'd been married four years, my mother-in-law got me an application for the fire department. I looked at my right? wife and I said, I think your mother's trying to get rid of me. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell me something. Sure, yeah. But uh, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I uh, I took the test. Uh, there was thousands of people took the test down at Civic Center in Baltimore. And uh, so this is nineteen. What year did you take the test? Seventy two. Seventy two. Took the test. I took the test and uh, I did better than I thought I would. I came out fifty two, and they took fifty three in the first class. Oh, in first class. Good for you. Yeah, I was man. in the first class. I took the test with my brother-in-law, who was a lot smarter than I was. and uh, But he came out number two. But he, never, <laughs> he never went to the fire department. Is that right? He passed. Yeah, he, went up, he went up working in a government job down in D.C. And uh, 
<laughs> yeah, I got in the fire department in 1972. What was the payback then, Ray? Do you remember? About uh, eight, eight or nine thousand a year, I guess. Wow. You know, it's it funny, Ray. As we talk about it all the time, like how your life changes by one simple act, right? Yeah. Something that is so special to you, right? All the guys that come on the show, they say the same thing. Everybody has this one little, you know, where the road goes like this, right? You, you were going down this path yes. and then, you know, somebody intervenes, whether it's a neighbor, your, you know, family, or, you know, in your case, your mother-in-law, and it puts you on a path to the best, you know, thing that ever happened to you. You know, one of the best things that ever happened to you besides your family, right? Oh, yeah. I probably wouldn't have had the family if I hadn't had the fire department. I mean, right. I, I was on a bad path, you know, and I knew it. And uh, so you had no kids yet when you got on. Oh uh, yeah, I had I had one son. I had my oldest son. Yeah, he was born in 1970. And uh, I got in fire school. I think I was in fire school about a week. And I thought, man, don't screw this up. <laughs> <laughs> you like this job? This is the best job you ever had. And you had no idea about the fire fire department at all, yeah, right? Like, I had, I had really no, no idea. No. Yeah, crazy. I was lucky to get in. I'll tell you the truth, because. Uh, I passed the test fine. Then they had the interview, and uh, I had a police record for fighting, and I had to have a separate interview. And I had I had fairly long hair then. And I go into the interview, and the guy says to me, "It's the seventies. Come on, you got a record here for for fighting." I said, "Yeah, I do." He said, uh, "You think you're a badass?" And I said, "No, no, 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 no." He said, "Yeah, you do. You think you're a badass?" And I thought. This guy's trying to piss me off. So we talked for a couple of minutes and he says, he looked at my hair and he says, well, I'll tell you this. If you get in the fire department, this has got to go. And he reached over and grabbed my hair, pulled my hair. And I was like, Ugh. and I calmed myself down. And I said, if I get in the fire department, I'll cut my hair. He said, get out of my office. And I thought, eh, there's another job shot in the ass. <laughs> and I went over and when I put my hand on the door to leave, he said, hey, and I turned around and he said, you're in. Wow. It changed my entire life. That right there. Oh, it wasn't, the whole thing was a test. Uh, when he pulled you in, had you knocked him out, you would have been done. That would have been <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he probably wouldn't have hired me. Yeah. I never liked you. Yeah. <laughs> 1972, how long was uh, the academy back then? It was eight weeks and five days a week. And on Saturdays, we rode a company that they sent us to. It wasn't either an engine or a truck. And were you allowed to operate there? Or you just rode with them. Oh no, we went. We went right into fires with them. Really? Wow. Oh yeah. I think I, I think I was in fire school two weeks, and they sent me to Ford Truck on the west side, which was an extremely busy place. And uh, I didn't know my ass from all the ground. And uh, <laughs> they told me they pointed to this guy. He probably had twenty five years and looked like they could holler at a fire that would go out. <laughs> they said, "You stick with him if we get anything." <laughs> And uh, we got a fire down the high rise, and it nasty, nasty ass high rise. And we had fire smoke coming out the fourth floor. I, I get off the truck, and uh, I'm trying to remember how to put a mask on. The mask were in big green boxes in a compartment on the truck. And I'm like, God, I got to remember how to put this one. And uh, that old firefighter John Franklin, he said, "We don't need a mask. Come on, and <laughs> suck it up." We went inside and went up to the fourth floor, and he said, "Grab my belt." And I grabbed the back of his wow. We started down the hallway. It was just a narrow hallway, apartments on both sides. Smoke's getting lower and lower. Mm -hmm. He's bending down. I'm not. I got his belt. I'm standing up. I'm dying. Snot <laughs> running. I can't see. I can't breathe. He's bent down real low. He's not having any problem. We get to the apartment that the smoke was. We, we go in. He took me right through one room right to the balcony, outside balcony, shoved me out, said, stay there, close the door. <laughs> <laughs> Slowing me down. <laughs> when he got the fire out, he came back and got me. He said, that wasn't much. Mattress and box springs, it wasn't bad. He said, come on, you can help us overhaul. And I, I was, we were, were overhauling, throwing stuff out. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I wonder if I'll ever be able to do this job like these guys do. I mean, they knew everything was like clockwork. They were a busy company. They knew what they were doing. And everything went like clockwork. Everything they did. It was, it was a learning experience right there. I'm, with just two or three weeks in the fire school. You know, we, we how many guys riding on the rig back then, Ray? Four. 
four, four on the engine, engine, four on the truck. We we say all the time, Ray, on the show, like you don't know how far you can go until somebody shows you mm-hmm. where you can go, right? Right. Like that, like that, like that's a perfect example of you're there a week and uh, you know a couple of weeks, and this guy's dragging you through. You, you know, yeah. you're like, I can't even believe where the hell we're going, right? You have no idea yeah. about the fire department. Next thing you know, you're like <laughs> ten rooms deep. You know, and uh, you know, you're like, I can't even believe I'm here with no mask. Forget about that. I mean, that's yeah, we didn't wear a mask back then. If you were on the, if you were on the uh, engine company, especially, uh, you didn't wear a mask if you were on the pipe and you were first in. You were expected to get in there and do your job until the guy that let off put a mask on and came in and relieved you. Yeah, we heard that before too, Roof. Why do you guys say that? The guy who, who let off, they they would take the mask and relieve you after he knocked most of it down, right? Yeah, you learn real quick. The lieutenant taught me real quick. You open up that hose on a half a, a half a fog, and you get that little pocket of air right by the nozzle. You put your chin down there, and you got more or less got something to breathe. You know enough to let you keep going. Right. It was a lot different. Man, it was so different when I came in than than when I left. Oh, no doubt. Right. How was the firehouse culture back then? Uh, at the kitchen table, what was it like? The same as it was when I left. <laughs> everybody <laughs> busted everybody's balls. I mean, it was always fun. It was always it's universal, fun. ain't it, Roof? Anywhere you go. Same thing. Yeah. Different same shit, table. Same shit, different patch. Yeah, the kitchen table was, was the spot in every firehouse. Yep. That's what solve we said, the world's right? problems, right? Oh, my God. Yeah, yep. solve all the world's problems. So that's why this is the only show that brings the kitchen table to you, that's right? What that's what we do here. That's what we do here. Yeah. So we yeah. So 72, eight weeks of fire school, you get assigned to engine 25. Now, they were slow house. They were middle of the road. What were they? Extremely busy. Oh, there you go. Extremely busy. Oh, oh look wow. at that. Wow. I wonder why that woman was chasing me around the house, for God's sakes. <laughs> Who is that young guy? <laughs> Who is that guy? Wow. Looking good there, right? Man. Kept we, the wore khakis. we wore khakis back then, <clears throat> which was real nice when you crawled in a a burning building. They were filthy dirty after one fire. Khakis. But it, you know, it was an extremely busy house. I asked when I was getting out of fire school, I was playing fast pitch softball. And the, the oh. pitcher on our team was uh, high up in our in local 734, our union. And I went to him and I said, and I want to go somewhere busy. I don't want to sit around. He said, I'll take care of it. And I got assigned to Engine 25 on the west side of Baltimore. Were they a single house or were they with a, a single, uh, single house built in the early 1900s? Still had the spots where the troughs were for the horses to drink out. Wow. That's cool. Is that it still was fire house still cobblestone, cobblestone floor. I mean, it was it was old. It wow. was big. It was, you know, you had the hose tower. You had to, you had to change the hose on Saturdays. Yeah. We had a second line engine in the back. It was about 200 feet deep, had a big back door where you could get the second line engine out the back door. We ran out the front door. Is that firehouse still standing today? It is, but it was closed. Oh, closed. they closed it? It's, it's nothing. It's just sitting there now. It was, it was closed years and years and years ago. So you, uh, you, uh, you evidently, you probably guys were riding the back step, right? No doubt. Oh, yeah. 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 Now, when I got to 25, they had just got a new wagon and we rode inside. But whenever it broke and you got a second line, you rode the back step. And if you were detailed to a truck company, you rode the side of the truck. If How I, was that back in the day, riding the back step? Like, like Louie and I were on it after that. That had to be amazing, right? Riding it the back. was. In fact, a 25 engine, I took the place of a guy who got thrown off and killed. Is this it? Ah, yeah, that looks like it, man. I mean, it's like, oh, I mean I was, where'd you get that picture? He's quick, that Gonzo. He is on his game lately, right, Roof? He is. I think I have to give him That's a That's a pretty cool. I think. I think it's hard no, to tell. When I Googled Baltimore City Fire Department uh, Engine 25, this is what came up. I found I saw a couple like this. It. Yeah, it's a real, you can tell it's a real deep. Yeah, it looks deep Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I'll pull it back up. Right it's a deep what, bay, is, yeah. what is that on top of the door that says? Uh, That's when the wholesale, so May, Mayfair Wholesale. Maybe we're saying with this, the, it was a vacant firehouse now, whatever the hell it was. But I guess they're selling something out of there. Yeah. That was at the corner of McCullough and Gold. Uh, yeah, that was. How much right. running were you doing back then, Ray? How much what? Running, how many runs you guys go on? Typically? Uh, you know, probably over 3,000, which was busy back then. Mm-hmm. Now, since they closed, I think since since I was in, they've closed 22 companies. Whew. And the busy houses now where my 
my bo- both my boys were in. They're doing over six thousand now. Yeah, wow, six thousand runs a year is a lot. Man. Six, I six, did, and the medics I did five thousand, five thousand six. You know, to six thousand. It's yeah. after a while. It's uh, what'd you say? Ninety was doing now, roof. They're doing over seven thousand runs. God. Oh. Yeah, the medic units, <clears throat> the medic units are doing between eight and ten. The busy medic units. Oh my god, eight and ten. And and now, you know, when I was in, we worked four fourteen-hour nights and four ten-hour days. Now they work twenty-four hours. If you're doing six thousand runs, working twenty-four hours, my youngest son's had thirty-two runs. I was going to say it's over thirty them. runs. Yeah. 30 runs was not yeah, uncommon. You're both in 30 runs. You're 24 hours. Right? The beep boop was going off. I was afraid to hit the 10 8 button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go 10 8 because I knew uh, there was. You a, knew they picked you up, right? Yeah, they pick you right up, man. I know my youngest son, he would be coming home and call me up on his way home to talk to keep him awake. He had like a, uh, an eight or 10 mile drive to get home from the firehouse. Yeah, hell he yeah. Would, he would want to talk just to keep him awake driving home. Yeah. Now, did you bring the boys? Like, did they have like up here? You have Christmas parties in the firehouse. You have picnics. Did the boys go with you to all those things in the firehouse? Not, not so much at the. We didn't have any, anything going on at the firehouse. Uh-huh. I would take them there and show them and, to meet everybody. Would they ride with you at all? Twenty-five engine. There was no room for anything. Oh, okay. Would they ride with you? You ever bring them in and let them ride with you? Not when they were kids. No. 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 We we were. They they fire your ass if you did that. Mm. I mean, they was they were pretty strict. They were pretty strict. Did they? Uh, did, did you? Did they? Did you know right away that the boys were uh, interested, or did that come? No, on they weren't. On? They weren't interested. They saw me come home, busted up, and burned, and said, "Not on that." And you were going, "Yeah, you might want to be a doctor." <laughs> yeah. 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 Cool, son. <laughs> Once they got into the real world and started working other jobs, and I said, uh, <clears throat> "I got my oldest son." He was he was too much, way too much like me, way too much like me. And I said, I, I got to get him an application. And I said, you go down and take the test. Him and his best friend, they went down and took the test. And it was the same way with him as it was with me. I think that that really put him. He on got the in path. there and was like, I don't want to lose this job. Yeah, yeah. Put him on the path. Yeah. And my youngest son was the same way. He was the same way. He was. He wasn't like me. He was more like my wife. He was more laid back. He had a lot more sense than me and my oldest son. And it, it took him a while. He went to college for a year to play football, blew his knee out. He came home and worked some different jobs. And finally, he said, I want to try a fire department. And he took the test. He did well. And he got in five years after his brother did. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. Who uh, who are some of the bosses? Who are some of the guys there when you first got to 25 that stick out to you that really took you under their wing type of thing? I had, I had a guy, a lieutenant named Lieutenant Baber. And he was a tough old bird. He came from another busy firehouse when he made lieutenant. But he was only there about a year when I, when I was there. And he, uh, he was burned out. He said, I got to go somewhere slow. And he transferred out. And the first actor, man, I don't know, you guys have a first actor? Somebody that takes the lieutenant's place. A firefighter when the lieutenant's off? No. no. Only if he goes sick during the tour, you have uh acting lieutenant would be the senior guy. Yeah, but- this was this was the senior guy in the house. If the lieutenant was on vacation, he took the lieutenant's place. And it was a black guy named Willie Gibson. And he was a great guy, man. He he taught me a lot what to do, what not to do. And uh he was one of the first one of the first blacks to come into the fire department, as a matter of fact. And he would tell me what it was like. When he came in, what he had to go through with the separate beds and separate eating utensils and separate sinks really? and That's all that stuff. Man. Yeah. But he didn't it wasn't he didn't tell it like he was bitter. It was just a matter of fact. And uh we would stay up late at night talking about all different subjects. And then uh we had another guy, he was a grouchy guy. I didn't like him, he didn't like me. We let that go. And there was another guy there named Bobby Simone, and he had two and a half years in. But all the 25 engines. So he had a lot, a lot of service. And he was another one that was helpful to me. You know, you, you, when you're a rookie, you need the fire school don't teach you nothing compared nah. to what you learn out <laughs> in the field. Oh, yeah. Would you agree with that? I mean, oh, absolutely. absolutely. On the job learning, nothing like it. Especially if you get guys who never had a job before in their life, you know, and they go oh, yeah. to the firehouse. <laughs> you know, yeah. I see you staring at the dishwasher sometimes. I'm like, you don't know how to turn on the dishwasher, bro? Are you fine? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? You don't, know how, to, life, you don't know how to make coffee. You know yeah, I know. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I got to show you how to make coffee. Yep. Yeah. 
we do that. It's funny you say that. We have, Come on. Yeah. This is how Still? you make coffee for you guys that don't know how to make coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Did I send it to the chief to teach him that? Is that what you do, bro? No, I, I pass that down. Ah, I just go like this. You, you don't care it <laughs> over there. Yeah, I, have good, I have a good team, man. These guys are solid. All right. <laughs> so you're there for two. How can you leave after two and a half years? I wasn't there enough. I, they detailed you other companies all the time. And every time I got detailed, I rode the medic, and I hated riding the medic. And I just wasn't there enough. And the captain of the 13 engine, which was about six or seven blocks south of 25, he was. Uh, he asked me if I wanted to come down there. He was getting an opening. And I thought, yeah, because that was a double house. So if you got detailed, you stayed in the oh, house. Just the floor, right? oh, yeah, that's yeah, perfect. Yeah. You learned the truck work, right? I, I, I sort of learned truck work. I, you know, if you don't ride it enough, you know, you're just doing what the guys are telling you to do. And when, well, I, when I was a 25 engine, I said, tell this story. Uh, they were rookie, don't know nothing. We go to a car accident up in Druid, big park, Druid Hill Park. Cars upside down. People were out there, they're screaming. And, uh, the guy lost his leg. Guy lost his leg. So, of course, I'm the rookie. The, cat, the lieutenant says to me, crawl in that car and get the leg. So the car's on its roof. I'm crawling on the inside of the roof. And I see the I see the leg. And I'm like, oh Jesus. And I get closer and I reach out and I realize it's an artificial leg. It's not a real leg, it's a prosthesis. So I crawl out of the car and I hold the leg up in the air. I said, I got it, I got it. And the people are screaming, they're hiding their eyes, they're turning away. We get back to the firehouse, man. We were laughing for an hour over and over. The people were freaking out. Everybody thought it was a real thing. It was, it was a good time. It was a good time in that house. I just wasn't there enough. Uh, so there's a story here that says uh, your first fire, uh, night work is engine 25. You were on the watch at 4 a.m.? Oh, yeah. The uh, My lieutenant, we'd been running all night. My, my first night there. And my lieutenant said, look, I'm not staying up. He put me on a four to six watch. He said, I'm not staying up all night with you. He said, see all these numbers on his desk? There's like 50, 50, 60 numbers on a desk. He said, if they call one of those numbers, you throw that gun. And he went to bed. I'm sitting there nervous. Oh, Christ, now what? <laughs> that half hour later, they called box 373, Fremont, Pennsylvania. I know it's here. I know it's on his desk. <laughs> it's, it's a building fire. Box 373. I'm looking up now. I'm nervous. I'm looking. Meanwhile, I can hear the guys. They hear it. They're getting up. They slide the pole. Lieutenant slides the pole, looks at me. I said, I can't find a number. He says, Christ, it's us. Get on the wagon. <laughs> we get we, we go a couple blocks, like five, six blocks. We got a body and fender shop burning, locked up, tight as a drum. Town chief gets there. Nobody can get in. Their truck company's working. They call a second alarm. Finally, they get the whole big rolling doors up about three feet. And my lieutenant says, come on, let's go. No mask. Crawl underneath. Three-quarter boots, I forget to pull them up. They're filling up with water. Crawl all the way in. You, I can't breathe. I can't see. Lieutenant's got my head shoved down by the pipe. I open it up. We we got cars burning. We got offices burning. I can hear them working on a roof. I can hear other companies hitting it with water. We finally darken it down. Lieutenant says, follow the hose out and take a break. So I crawl out, fuel in the hose. I crawl under the door. I throw up. I look up. There's a battalion chief. I almost threw up on his shoes. <laughs> he said, you all right, son? I said, hey, Christ, I'm all right. <laughs> I was spitting up black phlegm for two days. Beautiful. So nice what man. about uh, the fire where you knocked out the arsonist? Uh, we had a fire up. was called up the hill. Big, great big three-story, big joints, uh, all row houses. We pull up. We're first in. The truck company gets there. We're taking our line off. Truck company throws the 24 foot ladder. The guy that set the fire runs over and knocks the ladder down while they're getting the 35 off. They throw the 35, they go to put the 24, he throws, he knocks the 35 down. We're going inside, me and my lieutenant. We're going down the hallway. We find a guy laying in the hallway. My lieutenant says, I'm going to drag him out. You stay here, I'll be right back. So he's dragging him out the hallway. Meanwhile, Bobby Simone had let off. He comes in with a mask going, I got it, I got it. So I follow my lieutenant out. And by now, he's he's outside. He's got the guy on his shoulder. He's walking down the sidewalk. The guy that set the fire walks up. Boom. Hits the lieutenant in the, in the chest. Knocks him down. He drops the guy on, a, on the ground. 
I grabbed a guy to hit him. I beat his head into the concrete, knock him out. That's Let where the out. old days of fighting came in, Wolf. That's why he was, he was a fighter. The crowd's going crazy. Now they want a piece of me. The crowd's going nuts. And one guy was the instigator of the crowd. There's a cop there. Let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Ray. <laughs> you see Ray's face, he was like this. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Ray. He looks like Bubba Smith from the former coast. Great big guy. And he had this big, long, aluminum flashlight, and he poked it in this guy's chest. It was starting all the trouble. So I'm going to tell you one time, shut up. And the guy kept yelling, and he went, backhanded him in the mouth with this aluminum flashlight. I love it. Oh, the good so they got all the medics coming. The medic comes to take him away. They come to take the way the guy I knocked out. They come to take away the guy my lieutenant dragged out. We get the fire out. We get back to 25 engine. I want to talk about all this. They don't think anything of this shit. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? <laughs> this is my life. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just another good. day in another day in the <laughs> Holy Christmas. Another man. day in the ghetto, bro. Yeah. Let me see. Did I miss any stories from there? Nope. Nope. <coughs> no, that's good. Right? <coughs> Not that the arsonist. Yep. And I right, 74, you transferred to 13. Most of the you were never at 25. Right down the street. Six, six, seven blocks down the street. Oh, so that was a big house. You had uh, engine 13, truck four, ambulance, ambo four, and the beat and battalion four. And she four, yeah. Wow. That was a big house, man. Yeah. How many guys are you cooking for there? Whew. We didn't do a lot of cooking, to be honest with you. God, maybe once. Once a trick, somebody would cook. We uh -huh. didn't do a lot of cooking. Not not like you see now. We didn't do a lot there, in that house. But that's it was because, a tight house. That's because yeah. you weren't in the firehouse, right? Huh? That's because you weren't in the firehouse. You were out. Yeah, we weren't in there. You were right. <laughs> we didn't have microwaves yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> I have a microwave. You know, I forgot about that, Roof. What was it like back then? Because microwave only came out in the 80s, right? The so food, got, food got cold. You get cold. Like, You're eating cold. Yeah. Warm it up. Go out. Warm it up. Go out. After a while, I think that's probably wow. right. the, the One of the greatest thing. inventions yeah. for the fire service ever. <laughs> in fact, the first time I saw a microwave, I was detailed to another firehouse. I saw, I, I said, you got a microwave on here. I said, how do I use this thing? I said, I want to cook a hot dog. You know, you know, that you know, I was an easy mark. I said, How long I cook a hot dog? He said, Five minutes. <laughs> I just come out about that big. It was about this big. All shriveled up. <laughs> oh, you got me. I do buy myself, Frank. <laughs> but 13 uh, engine four truck was a really good house, really tight house. We had a great captain. He was real strict, but he was real fair. I mean, it, Somebody didn't clean the oven. He took the heating element out of it for a week. Couldn't use the oven. Nice. But eventually he was in on the card games and, you know, we bowled. There was a fire department shift bowling league. We all bowled in that. We played ball together. I played on the uh, fire department baseball team. We played different junior colleges. And played, the, played the Baltimore City Cops at Memorial Stadium before the Oriole game. Oh, that's cool. That was neat. It, it was all... It was a tight shift. It really was. It was a lot off duty. We were off duty. We hung together all the time. Everything we did was together. Bunch of us. Uh, so let's talk yeah, about some of the guys you got there. You got uh, Doug Falls, Stan Williams. You had the uh, nicknames for all of them. Or let's uh, let's talk about some of these guys. Well, I told you, Captain Gorleski. He was he was the captain, and he, mm -hmm. he was the captain. I mean, you knew he was the captain. You knew he was in charge, but. Uh, like I said, he was fair with everybody. If you screwed up and he got, he got in your ass, you knew you deserved it. You knew you deserved it. Stan Williams was a big guy, like 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, he had a scholarship for uh, as a tight end to Clemson. And uh, it didn't work out. He got homesick or something. He quit. Came home and joined the fire department. And he was, he was a lot of fun. He was a boisterous kind of guy. And Doug Falls, I went through fire school with. He wasn't there when I first transferred there, but he came in not after him. Not long afterwards, and he was hysterical. He was a tunnel rat in Vietnam. Oh my God, I love that. And he was—he oh, never, man. never wow. shut up. <laughs> Even when you played golf, he talked when you were hitting. He talked when he was hitting. <laughs> <laughs> he, he never stopped. Talking. But he was hysterical. He was—he oh. he could say stuff to Captain Gillespie that nobody else could get away with. 
He called him by his first name one time. We're playing cards. Come on, Ronnie. And we all look at <laughs> Come on, Ronnie. <laughs> yeah, they were good guys. They were a lot, a lot of really good guys. Man. That's so funny. And the oh. truck was the same way. The truck was tight guys. You know, we Chuck Cushto, we was a big blonde haired guy that uh, he knew his work. And you could always depend on him. But he was he was an easy mark. He was, he, was getting, he was getting married, and we met his wife, his wife to be, his fiance. And uh, we told him he couldn't get married until his chief, until his wife had an interview with the chief of the fire department. And he so he fell for it. Uh, <laughs> and he had to write a special commission to, to his wife to meet the chief of the fire That's department. That's awesome. I love and it. He wrote the special, and, and uh, our battalion chief was in quarters. And we told him, so you got to hand deliver it to the battalion chief and he'll he'll sign it and he'll send it downtown. And of course, we're all waiting. And he goes in, we can hear, he goes into the chief's office. And the chief, he was a no nonsense kind of guy, man. And Chuck goes in there and says, here's my special. And the chief said, what's this for? He said, it's requesting permission from my wife, to my fiance to meet the chief of the fire department so we can get married. And the chief said, what are you stupid? Don't you know they're pulling your leg? Get out of my office. <laughs> We're all outside laughing our ass. Oh my God, that's horrible. But he was a good guy. He was a real good guy. A lot of a lot of good guys in that house, man. Stayed Pootie. Here. What about Pooty? Huh? Pooty. Pooty. Pooty was a short little black eye that could outwork anybody on a fire ground. And we played pitch every night when we won night work at a, at a card table. And uh I don't know if you ever played pitch, but if you bid for and, and make it in our rules, you win all the money for that hand. And uh, you, you, had, you had to say you were all in. But he wouldn't say – he would stand up and act like he'd pull guns out. And he was a hell of a farmer. He was a hell of a farmer. That's great. Did you guys – Ray, you guys ran in with 25? Like, was since Long you guys time. were so close, was there like uh, – did you try and beat them in and stuff like oh, that? Man, the competition it was back then was more than it is now, I believe, anyway. And uh oh yeah, yeah. Everybody turned out quick and even and we had street boxes then and most of them were false. Didn't make any difference. If there was a 25 box and they were supposed to be first in, if we got there first, oh, uh, yeah. they didn't hear the end of it, man. <laughs> they didn't hear the end of it. Eight eight engine, ten truck where I wound up. They were west of us. It was the same way with them. The competition was fierce. It really was. It was good natured, but it was fierce. Not yeah, listen, I love that's, it. That's good. Makes hear, everybody man. better, right, Coops? It yeah, makes everybody better. You're right. Makes the upstate game. You know, <clears throat> we when we went there, when we turned the engine into a squad, they all hated us. They hated us because we would steal the boxes. We made them get oh, up yeah. and up. Yeah. Yeah. You're not gonna get out. We're gonna take your box. That's, that's all. right. Exactly. It's there for the take it. Yeah, so we nice if we beat him in, we'd ask him, what happened? Your doors stuck down, you couldn't get out. No. <laughs> oh yeah, what happened? Uh so July 75, July 17th at a dwelling fire, 536 Lawrence Street. Yeah, that was uh three blocks from 13 engine, middle of the night, like four o'clock in the morning, I guess. And it was a worker, and uh, Stan Williams had to pipe. I don't know where my officer, the captain wasn't working on it. I wound up behind Stan after I let off, and this place was rolling. And they were screaming that people were trapped. It was a three story dwelling, row house. And when Stan's uh, alarm went off for his bottle, I took the pipe and I wound up trying to go up the steps. And it was the hottest fire I'd ever been in. And I got to the third floor and my bell went off. And I kept going out of stupidity. And then when, of course, when your air runs out and the mask goes, yep. like that, can't breathe, took the mask off, went to go down the steps, fell down the steps, I fell about 10 feet. And I didn't know it. They told me later I crawled right over a two-year-old baby on a stairway. And uh, we lost um, six people dead, eight injured. And the guy that set the fire, a girl owed him $20. He said, I'll burn you out. And he firebombed the place. For 20 bucks. 20 bucks. Yeah. That's crazy. Hmm. You had some high-rise fires in the Mur Murphy homes? What are those like? Yeah, the Murphy homes. 
it was four buildings, 14 stories high, like a 14 story urinal. I mean, it was, it was, <laughs> it was terrible, terrible. That's a good one. I like that one. Story yeah. I've been in a couple of those. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible. We, we, had a guy, uh, we had a guy, he wasn't in our, wasn't in our house. It was in another house. But we go down there and they, they would throw stuff out of the high rise at us and stuff. We went down and, uh, he got this guy got hit. We had the cops with us, and this fireman named Ernie Florentine, old Italian guy, had twenty some years in. He got hit with a bottle and a helmet that broke, cut his face. Cops are staring. He grabs the cop. He's trying to get the gun out of the cops. Mm. And we grab. He's wrestling around with the cop. Finally, we pull him away. And later, I said, Ernie, what were you going to do if you got that gun out? He said, I was just going to start blasting away. <laughs> so that's a good thing you didn't get it out. <laughs> Crazy guinea. So us, we had people <laughs> shot in front of us while we were down there. I mean, it was it was mm. a bad, a bad, bad place, man. Wow, what? They blew them up a couple of years before I got out of the fire department. They blew them all up. Built low rises in there. What was that neighborhood like back then? Was it like the South Bronx? Would you say like was it run? Well, down I was never in the South Bronx, but I can I can tell you from what I've read, it probably was like the South Bronx. Right. I mean, it was it was a bad neighborhood. It got worse. It got worse. When the crack epidemic came, it got it worse. Willie Gibson, the old guy from 25 Engine, told me that at one time, Pennsylvania Avenue was the main thoroughfare through West Baltimore at the time. And he said there were nightclubs in there, all the top black uh, acts, the um, where the, the singers, the top singers, the top groups, they all went to Pennsylvania Avenue. It was really big. And when that, when everything got bad and everything got vacant, and the rats took over, and the crackheads took over. Man, I'm telling you, I never, I had been never in my life that I've been to West Baltimore before I got assigned a 25 engine or four truck. I was amazed. I was a lot amazed. of vacants, a lot of vacants there, right? Oh yeah, then and probably less than when I got in the fire department, it was 970 thousand people in Baltimore. Now there's 550 thousand. Wow. Everybody moved out that could move out. I felt sorry for the people that couldn't move. They were stuck. They could they they couldn't come out at night. When I was at eight inch and ten couple, they couldn't come out at night around there. I remember I think I told uh Kobo this. I remember I think it was ninety three, ninety four. <clears throat> uh we went to the fire expo down there oh, yeah. in Baltimore, right? In in the harbor. Yeah. And a friend of mine, he had like the scanner and everything. He, I had just got on the job, but he was like a big buff. Buff. And I remember driving around, like, in some of the blocks just outside of the hub. I don't know where, what part of Baltimore it was, but you could have told me I was in Lebanon. Like, oh, yeah. it was absolutely. Lebanon. Yeah, I mean, it was burned out <laughs> cars. It was, I mean, it was just people just sitting in the streets, like walking around. It looked like a bombed out. You know what I what I would think Lebanon or one of those places. It's funny like. you said Lebanon because I always compared it to Beirut. Yeah, Beirut, yeah. same yeah. thing, same type of thing. Exactly. I would tell people if they went to the Inner Harbor, I said, "Don't wander away." Yes. There, you go east yeah. or west, more than five or six blocks. Oh, it's incredible! I couldn't I mean, even believe what I was looking at. Man. I I was just talking. I don't know who the hell I was talking to. What amazed me when I first got on the job in in the project areas, like. Three o'clock in the morning, you get a run. There'd be kids playing like hopscotch and people out talking, and I'm like, it's three o'clock in the morning. Oh, yeah. And then the yeah. next day, 10, 11, 12, 1 o'clock, it's like a ghost. I Nobody's see awake. Go to sleep. <laughs> Nobody's awake. I used Nobody's to get the Go to sleep. Bizarro yeah. world. <laughs> yeah, I used to I used to drive a oil truck part-time. And uh if I had to deliver in a ghetto, I made my deliveries at between six and seven in the morning. Because all, all the crackheads were asleep yeah. at 6 or 7 in the morning. If you got there at 11 o'clock, they were getting up. They were looking for who they were going to rob. Yeah, they rob you. Right. Yeah, yeah. I did the same thing. I had a Tropicana route. <clears throat> Tropicana. Uh, so where are we? 1976, you get a new captain named Charlie Immel. Oh, yeah. Captain Golesky made chief. He left. And Charlie Immel was on four truck, and he wanted to do engine work, and he came over with us. That was a blessing, man. This guy was fun. He was a lot of fun. He was a, he was a good captain and uh, one hell of a firefighter. He, uh, one year with us, I don't know if it was 76, might have been 76 or 77. He was a uh, firefighter of the year for Baltimore City. He had three rescues. The last one we were with him, 
he crawled up the steps and uh, tipped the crib over. He couldn't stand up. It was too hot. Didn't have a mask on. He tipped the crib over and a baby rolled out. Wow. And he picked the baby up and crawled back down. And just as he got to the steps, the, the entire hallway and the, and the room flashed over. Mm. And uh, that was his third rescue of that year. Wow. And, uh, he got firefighter of the year. He used to turn, he used to turn a uh, tape recorder on when he turned out because he wanted to hear him. He wanted to practice if he was first in to say, work and fire. He'd walk around a firehouse going, work and fire. Fire. <laughs> fire. Working <laughs> fire. <laughs> yeah, one, day, one day I'm driving him. He goes to a box and uh, we don't see anything. And he's getting ready to call it a false alarm. And I look over and a half a block over on McCullough Street, flames are blowing out the third floor of this row house. I said, Christ, look over there. He picks up the microphone. He says, we got one. I said, you <laughs> fuck that up. <laughs> Been practicing for two months here. What's going on? <laughs> I don't know. I think you'll fold on the questioning, Henry. <laughs> yeah, he was a good guy. He was a good guy. I liked working with him. That's yeah. funny. Uh, what about uh, now we're up to 77? A lot of these guys still haven't been born yet. Uh, dwelling fire at 1700 Madison Avenue. Oh yeah, no gloves. I was with Emil then, and we had we had been we had a multiple alarm earlier that day about five six alarms in a lumberyard, and it was it was cold and raining, and I come back and I'm on watch. From, I think I had four to six or two to four, I forget which. But uh, I look out the window and across the street, block away, on the Linden mm-hmm. Avenue. Flames blow out of the third floor. I turn everybody out. We we go over there. They ask for the box. And uh, we get to the top of the steps. And I go to get my gloves. I left them back in quarters to dry on the radiator. And I'm, I, we're first in. I'm laying at the top of the steps. And I looked at Emil, who's snuggled up behind me. I said, Christ, I forgot my gloves. He said, I got a pair. I said, good. And he pulled them out. He said, but they're the only pair I got. And he put them on his <laughs> I like this guy. <laughs> I love him. I'm glad I'm putting the pipe under my arm and putting my hands in like that and crawling down the hallway. <laughs> there you go, yeah. And That's we found cool. a guy in there. Oh, Christ, I shouldn't even tell this. We found a guy in there dead. And when the smoke cleared, there was blood all over the bathroom. The guy was laying in the bathroom. And we said, man, we better leave him there. We should call the cops. And there were two cops. One of them I grew up with. They hung in my, hung in our firehouse. And you know their their sense of humor was just as bad as ours. And this guy had been they had cut his throat, shot him, and set him on fire. Well, they wanted to make sure he was dead. The cops said, <laughs> "Worst case of suicide I've ever seen." Oh my god! <laughs> so man, don't say that. Man. <laughs> he ain't lying. <laughs> I wasn't lying. <laughs> Cut himself shaving. Yeah. yeah. Himself shaving. That was a sharp razor. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, 1970s, Doug gets burned. Who's Doug gets burned? Doug Falls, the talker, the guy who won't shut up. Oh, the talker gets burned. <laughs> yeah. We get a. We get a Did that shut fire. him up when he got burned, or he was still talking? Oh, uh, I got burned, but he, he, he was still talking the whole time oh. we were in there. <laughs> we, crawl, I'm behind him. We crawl down the hallway and. Uh, hmm. Just as we start into the room, it's burning. A big, a big room burning. Somebody, some idiot, stuck a hose in the in the window and blew it right on back on us. And Dougie threw him. We wound up out in the hallway again. So I said, "Come on, we'll, we'll get it. We'll get it this time. We'll go back in." And he's like, oh, "I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it." He's talking and talking. We start in. Part of the ceiling comes down. We got three quarter boots on, and he's he's crawling, and it goes right. The embers go right down his boot. And they're burning his leg. He's like, ah, cry, ah, ah. and he's taking the hose and he's trying to shoot it down his boot. And every time he takes it off the fire, the fire gets worse. So we back back out again. So I said, I'll take the pipe. I sh- about that, I stuck the hose in his boot again. I said, I got it. I'll take it. So I go in and I work it. And we get, I get the fire out and my bell's going off. So I go over to the window and I take my helmet off and I take my mask off and I lean out the window to get some air. Just as twenty truck four is throwing a twenty four foot ladder into the window, they can't see me because of the smoke. Hit me right between the eyes. Bong! <laughs> knock me out. Only knock me out for a couple seconds. <laughs> Only a couple seconds. <laughs> yeah. oh I mean, they take me outside. 
Doug's over you like this. Yo, like, you got knocked the fuck out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to steal your shoes. <laughs> wow. That's Dougie crazy. says, oh, oh, you sure see my leg. You sure see my leg. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. With the yeah, he was great, man. He was great. Oh, my God. Coop, can you imagine? You finally get, catch a break. You stick your head out the window and get a blow. And the person hit you with the ladder. <laughs> Right? Like I had to hurt like a bitch. I <laughs> yeah, did. Gary through the plywood out the window, and it came down like a piece of paper and hit the <laughs> captain right in the head. <laughs> oh, man. All right, so we got, we got a fire on Fremont Avenue, too. Yeah, 78. Yeah, like I said, the competition was fierce to beat, beat the companies in. Also, eight engine, get to this fire, dwelling fire, second floor. We get there at the same time, inch and a, inch and a quarter line, inch and three quarter line. We're going inside. I'm the pipe man, eight inch of pipe man. We get there. We're going to mask up. The mask is dangling there. Got to take your gloves off, take your helmet off, put the mask on, pull the straps, put the helmet on. All I'm, I'm out of the corner of my eye. I can see him. He's keeping. We're both doing the same thing. He stops to put his gloves on. I said, I ain't putting my gloves on. I go up the steps, no gloves. I get, to, I get up to the top landing, the fire's over to my left. And as I go to turn, somebody hollered, look out, look out, it's over your head. And I turn and look, and it, it blows out in a ceiling over my head. And I just curled up into a ball and put the pipe straight up over my head and opened it. And everything, all the fire's falling, and I can feel it landing on my hand. There's nothing I can do about it. So it, I hear guys hollering, you all right, you all right? And I said, I'm okay. So I get the fire out. And I asked Chuck Cushto from the truck, I said, shine your hand on my light. I think I burned my hand. And he, sh I mean, your light on my hand. He shines his light and all the skin is hanging oh, there like a spider the like this. I said, ah, geez. So I, I go outside. I'm in the medic unit. And this, this is fire department. This is just like firemen. I'm in the medic unit. It's getting ready to bandage my hand up, getting ready to pull away on the back door of the medic. Chief. Stop. Chuck Cush there, the guy that was in there to shine his light. They open, he opens the door. He says, you all right? I said, yeah, I burned my hand. I said, I got to go down to the uh, hospital. He says, you're not coming back to work today, are you? I said, hell no. He said, can I have your lunch? I said, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I, was off, I was off quite a while. I was first in some second degree, and I was off for uh, – yeah. Over a month, I guess. Holy! Sh I thought he, I thought you were going to say he was going to say, "Here's your gloves." <laughs> <laughs> so, that would have been more. Uh, I was lucky I didn't get in trouble for that. That that's when I went to ten truck. Eight ten truck, not eight. I, sorry, you mentioned eight as well, so I thought you might have had some uh, correspondence with these guys for eight engine. No, you know what happened when I was at twenty five and thirteen. Nobody was taking pictures. No, there were no phone cameras. You know, when I got to eight and ten. We had a, a, a guy that rode with us named Jim Keefe. Great guy. He was a pharmaceutical salesman for Lilly. And he was also a professional photographer. He did weddings. And he was a fire buff. And he had permission to ride with 13 truck, Rick Lego, his company. And he rode with 10 truck, where I was, where I had gone. And he that's where all these pictures are from. Let me see that picture again, Gons. Who was, who was some of those guys in there? Uh, the guy on the far left, that's, that's Rodney Carter. Hell of, a, hell of a farmer. And the guy in the middle, he was a lieutenant. I mean, the guy next to Rodney, that was, he, we called him Duke. He got, uh, he got all busted up on a fire and when it collapsed, broke, broke eight ribs. The guy bending down went through fire school with my son, Ray. That's Moose. He was, he, like was a moose. He, he, he was, he was a moose. He was a big, powerful boy. And the guy standing up with the mustache next to him was the pump operator, Alex. And then Bob McMillan next to him, the tall boy, we rode to work together for years and years, carpooling into a 10 truck. And then Charlie next to him, he was with us for a little while. He came over as first actor man. And then me. And then Mike Prozier, he was the other EVD with me. He, we called him the Energizer Bunny. You couldn't wear him out. I mean, he, he would work, I think, until he, until he dropped dead. Uh, and another, they were all, I was so lucky in all the years that I was in that I've worked with so many Really good, good firemen, man. I felt like I was extremely lucky to have that happen. It's like Disney World, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they were they were a bunch of good guys. 
I don't keep in touch with many of them anymore. Well, Rodney died of cancer. Duke died. Moose just retired. I talked to Alex. I talked to Bobby. And Mike moved to West Virginia when he retired. Mike Prozier. He moved to West Virginia. Wanted to go as far, far away from West Baltimore as he could get. Uh-huh. Yeah, hell yeah. All the rigs in Baltimore still white? Uh, Yeah, now they are. Yeah, I think yeah. they are. Except, Except his, we, we, had, we had the Gray Ghost. It was a, there it is. That's the one I drove until that's it, the gray ghost. That's the gray ghost that was supposed to be painted, and they never did it. They left it primed for years. <laughs> no numbers, no nothing, no nothing, no nothing. That's like nothing. the generic fire truck. That's no stuff. frills right there. I gotta oh, tell Potter, oh, Danny Potter, right. no frills. That was a that truck. But you that would it rode like the wind. I mean, it, it would five speed and it could really roll. And the neighbors, they knew it as the Grey Ghost. The cops knew it as the Grey Ghost. I freaking love it, man. That's a great pick. Look at that thing, huh? That's over the roof of 10 truck. That, my, that photographer friend of mine, Jim Keefe, he took that. You all can those see buildings. Look at all, all the three same. store dwellings. Yeah. Block not after a, block after block. Not a car on the road. <laughs> no. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a pickup truck coming the other way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But before you went to 10, you were at uh, 15, right? Yeah, before... Well, I got promoted to EVD, and I went to uh, 25 truck. In a, it was the second slowest truck company in Baltimore City. And I uh, almost went out of my mind there. It was just way, way, way too slow for me. I was called a floating EVD if they needed it anywhere in that battalion, if they needed somebody to drive or tiller. But all three trucks were slow in that battalion. Oof. I didn't like it. And then... Uh, Captain Gillespie called me up. Said, I hear you're not too happy. Yeah, he was the chief of the busy battalion. I said, no, I'm not. And he said, how'd you like to float with me? I said, oh, I'd, I'd appreciate it. And I, I think I floated for less than a year. And then I, when he called me up two weeks later, I was in his battalion. And I wound up in 15 truck, which was in the east side in a ghetto. Single house, real busy. And, and a bunch of good guys, guys that knew what they were doing. Had a big, big barrel-chested lieutenant that I watched him pick a civilian up that staggered into the firehouse screaming at us. He picked him up by the seat of his pants and his collar, threw him out of the firehouse bodily. I was like, wow, well, I like this guy. <laughs> we need more of that. I, I, was there, I was there for a couple of years. Had had some good fires there. Where is that picture, guys, with the three guys walking away? Where was that? Oh, that, that was uh, – that's Bob McMillan and me and, and Mike Crozier on the right. That was it. That was it. That's a uh, old ten truck. That's the gray ghost. That's the back of the gray ghost. That's a great picture, man. Yeah, I like that. Jim Keefe took that one too. We had maybe it was a second alarm on Pennsylvania Avenue. We were walking back to the truck in the rain. Oh, there's the little T ten under there. Yeah, truck ten. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the a great smallest pick. tiller cabs I've seen. After a while, that tiller cab broke, and instead of fixing it, they just took it off. So, <laughs> so you were driving like Kramer. Sat out, yeah, you know, like Kramer. <laughs> <laughs> At fifteen oh, truck, when I went to fifteen truck, their first line truck was was uh, just a windshield and a steering wheel, no cab. And I used to tell there were younger younger guys there. I used to tell them, I said, "Man, make you put your seatbelt on." I said, "If you hit a curb, you'll go flying out of there." And there was a guy there named Tony Rose, good guy, man, nice guy, young guy. He was still in, didn't put a seatbelt on. He got hit by a car at Fayette and Patterson Park. And somehow, by the time they got it stopped, he was up inside the wheel well of the tiller. And mm. his leg was almost cut off. And we were, I was at a union meeting. And uh, they announced that 15 truck just racked up and it's bad. Sounds bad. The rescue's going. So we, we left and, and rode up there. The time we got there, they had to take the tiller wheel off to get him out. Oh my yeah. God. He was screaming for him to kill him. He was in so much pain and uh, they saved his leg, but he was never able to come back to work. Oh my if God. He would have had the seatbelt on. Nothing would have. I've had a few guys in the wheel. Well, they don't usually do well in there. No, no. 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 we will wind up at the wheel. Well, it's not a good place. No, no. And I was there for a couple of years. 10 we're talking about, right? I was 15. Oh, 15, but then you go to 10. You got any good fire stories from 10? 
Oh yeah, ten. Ten was. <laughs> you ten, ten, I, well, I spent seventeen years at ten. Ah, so oh. one, oh, or two, one or two coops, one or yeah, two maybe. Just a few. Yeah, a couple, uh, three or four. <laughs> yeah, I worked with uh, Lieutenant Dolch, who was probably eight. Eight. That's him on the left with the white hair. I love it. Uh, hard as nails, this guy, man. Now five eight, five eight. If I'm stretching it, then uh, <laughs> Coop stretches it all the time. But that's it. <laughs> and and, and if, if, if if you did something and another officer hollered at you, man, he would come over and get in that officer's face and scream at him. If he needs to be hollered at, I'll holler at him. Hell yeah. And he was in the old school, no mask. Boy, very. You saw him with a mask. It was like, hey, look, look, he's got a mask on. <laughs> Yeah, very, very solid. He was a man. It used to be five ten, Ray, but you know when you get the gray hair, you start shrinking. You know, start shrinking. That's right. <laughs> it's shrinking. We, we're down the high ride. We're down to Murphy Homes, and like I said, Murphy Homes was filthy, filthy, filthy. And we get a fire on the eighth floor, and the elevators were always out of service. They were broken, and so me and and uh, Rick Schulberg and Marty Loftus, we put masks, tanks on, got the mask hanging down. We got to run to the eighth floor. Well, Dolch, who was a lot older than us, but with no mask on, and he was in great shape. He takes off. He beats us up there. We get up there. He's, he's kneeling down. He says, Christ, the smoke's down to here. And, and the, the door is closed to the hallway at each end. So we mask up. He opens the door. We go in. We're crawling. I go, we drop this door open. I go all the way down, drop the other door open, try and get some ventilation. I'm coming back. I'm, I'm, I'm duck walking, coming back. There's Lieutenant Dolch. His mouth is on the floor of this hallway and his lips dragging on the floor. <laughs> I look down at him. I said, how's it floor taste, Lieutenant? He said, fuck you, Larkin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. He was a good guy, man. Hmm. He was a, he was a, a hard guy. And uh, Rick Sludelberg worked there. He, he drove an artillery. And uh, man, he could drive too. He could, <clears throat> he could make that thing fly. And it was a, and it was a really, really good fire. And that's what I said. I had so much luck working with these guys that were such good firefighters. You had, you had to worry about your back. These guys had your back at all. I'm time. sure they said the same about you, Ray. Huh? I'm sure they said the same thing about you. Oh yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I would hope they did. Yeah, I would no hope doubt. They did. Uh, so November twenty first, eighty five, Lieutenant Nelson. Taylor. Yeah. He wasn't on our shift. We came in on day work and uh, his shift was still standing. They were standing, staring out the door. And uh, I walked in. What's going on? And somebody said, Lieutenant Taylor got killed in a dwelling last night. Turns out that they had had a fire in a basement and he was on eight engine. Lieutenant Taylor was. And the pipe man, they stopped to mask up in gloves. And he got done before the pipe man. He said, I'll take the pipe. And he went in and he got to the basement steps and he started down and it blew back and he threw himself backwards and there was a refrigerator behind him and he bounced off of it and rolled down the steps. And uh, the captain of the truck, Lieutenant Captain Fugate, he tried to get him and he wound up getting it uh, almost, almost died himself. Uh, Lieutenant Taylor died down there in the basement and they left. It pissed me off. They left the whole shift on duty the rest of the night running mm -hmm. if, if they got another fire. Oh, out. my God. How did really? you do that? Oh, man. It was, it was, oh. Who the fuck made that call? I, uh, I guess the chief. I don't know. Chief of fire department, I guess. Yeah, that was cold. That was cold. That, that pissed everybody off. Hell yeah. Taylor was, I didn't know him that well. He was on the other shift. He worked on the east side for most of his career, but everybody that talked about him had nothing but good things to say. Yeah, 26 years, it says, huh? That's... Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it was a shame. shame. And what about the high-rise fire in the Murphy homes? The well, that was the one about Dolch, which crawling on the floor. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Kind of crawling on the floor. Oh, there's no back on that one. Mm -mm -mm. And I had a fire on Lawrence Street again. Yep. Lawrence Street was a <clears throat> busy street. And we pull up. And there was a girl, the smoke coming out the second floor, two story joint. And uh, there was a, a young teenage girl sitting on the steps. And me and Donald Horton got off. And I said, There's nobody in there, is it? She said, Oh, yeah, my mother and father are upstairs in the bedroom. Oh, my God. 
So we rush upstairs. They were in the back bedroom, and it was a middle room burning. And we crawl past the middle room, and we force the door open about halfway. And we find a guy, and we drag him out to the steps. And we go back in, and we're pushing on the door, pushing on the door. And we finally get in, and we find a woman. She, the reason we couldn't get the door, she was behind it. And we drag her out. And the whole time I'm thinking, I know Moose is coming with this pipe so we don't get trapped in here. And, and that's what I said. You could depend on these guys, man. Mm. And the eight engine came up and we crawled by and they were coming in to, to hitting the fire. And we crawled to the steps, dragged the people outside, and uh, they both made a full recovery. Oh, wow. Thanks, that's awesome. back. And there's a picture, one of the pictures in there of me and uh, Donald Horton sitting on the running board of the truck after we pulled those people out. That's it right there. And the guy, Jim Keith, that took that picture, he said it's one of his favorite pictures. And what was telling on that picture that we didn't know until later, you can see I'm relaxed. I'm, I'm okay. Donald's leaning on his knees, leaning on a truck, like he's having trouble breathing. I was saying it's a tripod position there. Yeah. Oh, damn it, that EMS coming out on you. Look at I, you. I, 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 <laughs> Who are you? Hey, listen, we, we've been talking about it all night. That's all I got oh, no. in my head is uh, defibs and uh, <laughs> defib <laughs> blood stops. Oh, <laughs> Well, a couple of years after that picture was taken, he was home and had a massive heart attack and died. Uh, uh, yeah, he was in his, I think he was like 40 some years old, late middle 40s. Look at you there. That guy looks like a movie star, rough for crying out loud. Look at that. <laughs> I, yeah. I like looking at it because I'm thinner there. <laughs> <laughs> I was probably 185 there, and now I'm 220. Did you get uh, a medal or a citation for that? Anything for nah, that? We, we probably would have. We didn't push it, and we had a we had a really tough battalion chief. He was hard to please. And, uh, hard to please. You say to people who lived. I mean, come on. What yeah, else I mean, do? that was the way it was. It was just the way it was back then. <laughs> That's crazy, right? Just doing the job, right, bro? Yeah, yeah. John Johnson said Charles Bronson. He does look a little bit like Charles Bronson. There that. you go. Yeah, I have had uh, that all my life. Really? <laughs> Put that I've picture heard that back all up. my life, yeah. Johnny Johnson, Johnson's right. Back up. Which one pick you want? The same one we just had? Oh, yeah, Johnson. yeah. I would rather look like Brad Pitt. It <laughs> didn't work out. <laughs> and then in 86, I burned one whole side of my face in a gas meter uh, in a basement fire. We had it knocked. It was just smoldering in places. And we didn't know that the gas meter was leaking. And all of a sudden... I had a helmet on with the shield down, no mask. And uh, all of a sudden it lit off and the gas was inside my mask and it burned the whole right side of my face. Ouch. And uh, I dove out the basement window. It was about 20 degrees outside. And I'm laying there thinking, man, I hope I didn't burn my eye. I hope I didn't lose my eye. And the paramedics came running over and uh, poured cold water on it. And took my breath away. And then they thought I was having a heart attack. <laughs> took me to the hospital and they kept putting cold compresses on it and wound up smearing silverdine all over it. It was all blistered up. And so I was in there a couple of hours. They released me. I go back to 10 truck, take my gear back. And get, get my, I'm going to get my car and go home. I walked in and the guys were like, God damn. You know, and Donald looked at me and said, you were no Robert Redford to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was a no. I was off duty for quite a while with that one. That was that was pretty painful. I was gonna pull that up for you. There you go, kid. Um, Somebody they're asking about the towel ladder with no boom that was running calls. They want you to talk a little bit about the what? The towel ladder that had no boom. I'm assuming the towel with no boom running calls. That's that's not mine. Well, all right. Well, there you go. Come on, Tonneman. What are you doing? Because <laughs> I had uh, Tom was hitting it up too. Uh, Tom, you don't you'll get that 20 bucks back, Tom. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Different guy. It was maybe ladder 49, maybe. I don't know. <clears throat> maybe. All right. So 87. Uh, I, met, uh, I met Joaquin Phoenix. Oh, did you? He was riding 10 truck. I was I had just retired. Just retired. And they had him riding 10 truck to learn how to act like a fireman. And so, uh, somebody else from Baltimore saying that they were really cool. Both of those guys, Travolta. And oh yeah, my son, my son, John Travolta rode five truck with my son. I got a picture of it, my son and him to stand next to each other. But the guys at Ted Truck called me up and said, uh, Joaquin Phoenix 
we're going down to, to the bar down in Canton. He's buying. We want you to come down and meet him. And we, I went down there. And he was in a, he's a little guy, man, like five foot seven or something. And whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, hold on a minute. Here. Oh, you're not standing up. I can't tell I told you. Uh, well, I am standing up. <laughs> hey, Ray, five seven might be a stretch, too. I'm just <laughs> saying. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Remember what I told you about when you get the gray hair, you start shrinking? Oh, you don't have, uh, have any hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's where they get the seven oh, inches I know from. what I wanted to tell you. When I was a 15 truck, we got a, a little garage vacant, full of garbage. We go inside, and no mass, four of us, and the engine's there, and we're pulling pulling things apart and everything. And so, whatever was burning affected us bad, and we all were having shortness of breath and, and throwing up. So they called medic, and we, we know we're going to be all right, but they called a medic units. So they take me. They're taking me to Johns Hopkins Hospital. And the guy driving the medic was a good friend of mine. We played softball in the fire department, softball team together and everything. His name was Jerry Morgan. So they, we get to the hospital and I'm on a stretcher and they take me out and they're wheeling me in the hospital. And just being a smart ass, I, I grabbed Jerry by the arm. I said, Jerry, I said, if I don't make it, promise me you'll have sex with my wife twice a week. <laughs> And he looked me right in the eye and he said, I'm not cutting back for nobody. <laughs> <laughs> I had no comeback. No <laughs> that's it. There's a mic <laughs> drop right there. Mic drop. Yeah, mic oh drop. Oh, my God. Wow. That's uh, freaking uh, awesome, I meant to tell you that. We were talking about 15 truck. I forgot. Uh, put that other question up. Somebody. Yeah, it was Mike uh, Ray. I'm sorry, oh, Mike, Mike Moritz. Mike Moritz. I did. He was the captain of 10 truck, not on my shift. He wasn't on my shift, but I, yeah, microphone Mike. That's what we called him. Good, good guy. Good. His father, I worked with his father. His father was a captain of 14 engine. Oh. And uh, when I got detailed down there, he was really a strict captain. Mike wasn't as strict as his father, but he was, but he, they called him microphone Mike because he would call in the size up and it would go on and on. You know, there's, the windows are down. There's flowers in the windows. <laughs> <laughs> Yellow curtains. Uh, oh, he was a real good guy. I think he wound up uh, going up to New York when he retired, I believe. But I'm not sure. Not, not in the fire department. Why would you do something like that? up here for relatives or something. I'm not oh, sure. All right. I'm I still never laughing really about that guy. Different. Oh, that's it's freaking great. funny, man. All right. So December 87, paramedic Pam. Yeah, she was. we called her Aunt B off of um, Andy Griffith's show. She was a chunky, chunky girl. Come from that's her. Came from uh, up in the up far out in the county somewhere. Paramedic signed our house, and we thought she'll we, we thought she'll never last. There's too much blood, too much gore, too much everything for a look, a little country girl like her. And and we bugged her, and she she fit in. She gave it back. And she was everybody wound up really looking out for her and really liking her. And she, and she would work, they worked all 14 hour nights and she was exhausted when she got done. And I was sitting at the watch desk and she was leaving. And I said, uh, Pam, you take it easy going home. You had a rough night. She had about a 25, 30 mile drive. Oh, I will. And she left. And I went back in the kitchen and uh, Captain Fugate came back about 15 minutes later and he said, everybody listen up. He said, I hate to tell you this. He said, Pam's dead. She got to Lafayette and Druid Hill. And blew through the light without thinking about it. Hit, got hit by a bus, killed mm. her instantly. Ejected her right through the passenger window, killed her. Wow, that was tough, man. I come home and told my wife, man, I had tears in my eyes. That was that was that was tough, man. Her father was a uh, captain in the Baltimore County Fire Department. Oof. To this oh, day, wow. he swears it because they worked the paramedics after death. You know? Yeah, maybe she just lost. Uh, she just lost concentration. Yeah, yeah, exactly. She used to cruising through the lights with the lights and siren. Yeah, yeah, you know what? That's so true, man. Look at that either. Yeah. That's right, so true. The, the dog story in Engine 36. Oh, well, should I tell this story? Hell oh, yeah. <laughs> ah, come on. <laughs> Don't say that. Now you have to. Now you got to. 36 can't Engine leave. was a. Now you can't leave. <laughs> 36 Engine was a single company that we ran with. They were a mile away from us or so. Single house, good guys. And uh, fire prevention week, they would bring in. School classes, show them the fire engine. So they bring in a kindergarten class or first grade, whatever it was. They bring them in the 36 engine. Well, they, they fed a ghetto dog there all the time. 
So the kids are all like, is that the fire dog? Is that the fire dog? <laughs> they were like, yeah, it's the fire dog. Make them happy. So they told the teachers, they said, look, if the gong goes off, we got to get out of here. You got to get the kids off to the side, make sure, you know, everybody's away before we pull out. Oh, no. So they get oh, a run, no. the gong goes off, the kids are all on the side. They get up in the truck, pull out, boom, boom, ran right over the dog, killed it. <laughs> The kids are screaming, they killed the fire dog. They killed the fire dog. I knew you were going. Minutes, within 20 minutes, everybody in the fire department that was working knew, knew what happened. Oh, my God. That's so funny. No, oh. it is. It is to us. My wife said, you shouldn't tell that story. What is that? Yeah. One, That's the 36 engine where he was. So. Oh, 36 engine. All right. There you go. That's a yeah. good looking job. Yeah. It's- just wanted to share that. a little something I had there. Oh, that's good. Then in '89, I had a fire. We had a fire at four in the morning on Presbury Street, mm. and I was leaving for Cancun on vacation the next day. And I said a little silent prayer to the fire gods, to maybe leave us alone the rest of the night. And uh, we went out. I don't know, three or four o'clock in the morning. I was, I was, was I driving? Yeah, I was tiller, and Rick was driving. And uh, we pull up two-story joint and there's this big woman in the window on the second floor and she's got two kids one on each side of her one's passed out across the windowsill the other one's just staring and she's screaming hysterically she's a big woman man she's screaming hysterically so there's a guy on a step ladder a civilian on a step ladder trying to get to her so we pulled a 24 off we kicked kicked the step ladder out of the way and i'm going up the ladder i'm thinking i got to get this kid who's unconscious before he falls back in. And the smoke is just roaring out of this place. And I get about halfway up the ladder and she dives out the window, comes straight down my ladder. And I grabbed the rails and turned my head and she crashed into me. And I'm like, God, it's still here. I thought for sure she'd take me with her. And I took her down one rung at a time and I got her on the ground and I got her over. And I said, "There's no, is there anybody else in there? She said, there's five more people in there. And Holy Rick shit. and Donald had thrown another ladder next to the 24 and they got the boy out that was in shock staring and then rick went up did a great job the window came down on the kid and rick went up and pushed the window up and straddled the windowsill got the kid out pulled his leg out climbed down the ladder brought him out i went inside me and donald went inside and it is roaring rooms and uh can't get to the back the back's not the front's not burning but it's if I move and there's nobody with a line yet, it's going to get us. And here comes somebody with a line, eight engine with a line up the steps. And they're hitting it. And another 13 or, or somebody else came up and they're hitting it. And I said, don't let that get down this hallway. And me and Donald crawled down the hallway. And we found a teenage boy in a, in a side room and dragged him out. And we crawled back down. We found a woman in the front room, dragged him out, her out. And somebody found a grandmother in a chair, uh, not too far from the window. And somebody else got somebody else out. It was five of them all together. And, uh, but none of that, we, we lost all five of them. The only ones that lived were the three that we got out the window. So she jumped out the window and left her two kids there? She come down head, head first, left her kids in there. Left her kids in there. Hmm. Yeah, that, that blew my mind when I was thinking about it afterwards. Yeah. I mean, I've seen that a few times too. With the, with that, people mm. like really panic and they they just forget what their responsibility is. I guess I don't know. Yeah. What? What? Yeah. Well, I couldn't believe I was still on that ladder when she hit me because she probably she was probably two hundred and fifty pounds. Woo! Bumbles bounce. Look at Ruffy, he's on it. He got a new stent. It's a new Ruffy, man. I don't know. (laughs) He's getting up to the head or something. I don't know what it is. Blood flow's flow's much much better now. (laughs) Blood flow's getting up to his head now. He's not so hard. All right, so Bryce Street, that's 1990. You don't know when it was, 1990 something. 1990, yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah, we uh, 13 truck was on that fire with us, Rick Lego's old company. And uh, we had a report of kids inside, and we get in there, and we're searching, searching, and we don't find anybody. 
And uh, I went to the window. I, I hollered to the chief. I said, we can't, there's nobody in here. He said, the people swear to God, there's four kids in there. So we, we back inside, we're searching and searching. <clears throat> and uh, one guy, this uh, Paul Hebron from 13 Truck, he said, oh, I got them. They were in the bathroom behind the toilet. They were small and they crawled under the sink and behind the toilet. And we, we, we lost three, one lived. We got, but Paul, he had come in the back window and in that bathroom and searched that bathroom, never thought to look behind it. He couldn't say, of course, there was smoke, but he never thought to look behind the, bath, the toilet. And uh, he was beside himself. He took that one hard. He, he, oh, he took that real oh, hard. Yeah. Uh, the guys from his company, you, you could see they were, they surrounded him, just talking to him, telling him, man, nobody would have found his kids. No, you know, you can't think, you, you look everywhere, you don't look behind the toilet. Yeah, you don't look behind the toilet. And then to have four of them there is yeah, insane. Yeah, it's all small too, little young kids. That's oh. horrible. So uh, night, April 18th, 1990, Donnie Horton dies. Yeah, that was my buddy at 10 Truck. He's the one I said had a massive heart attack at home. Oh, okay. Lieutenant Dolch called me up. I was home. He said, uh, you better sit down for this one. I said, why? What's the matter? He said, Donald died today. And I could have knocked me. Me and Donald, were, we, we were, you know, the whole shift was tight and losing him was so unexpected and so he was the practical joker on the shift. Mm. You know, you might get a water balloon in your face coming out of the quarters. And, and uh, yeah, that was that was a blow to all of us. It was really upsetting, really upsetting. And then 1990, my son got, my son Ray got in a fire department. Like oh, said, yeah, 1990, huh? Yeah. 1990. Oh, you're your oldest son, right? Yeah. Getting ready to retire. That's him right there. That was an unusual experience because... He was detailed to 10 truck and I was wow, driving. That's crazy. He was crazy. He was still And we had, we had a little fire, 10 cent fire and Jim Keith took that picture after the fire. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a good picture. Good picture. That's a great story too. I mean, How old is he there? Looks young. How old is he there? Was he, he in his, he's obviously, he wasn't see, 30 yet, right? He's, he's 53 now. He was probably in his late. Late 20s. Yeah, probably late 20s. Yeah, late, I think he was 20 when he got in, and he made EVD three years later. So he was probably 26, 27, 28, somewhere in that. Does it work? I mean, it kind of, I don't know, you know, we still have hooks here and stuff like that. Were you were you able to put him where you wanted to put him, or he just was a uh, When he got out of fire school, I had had, I had, had some difficulties with the, at the chief of the fire department, some arguments, and uh, – I asked him to go to a busy house, and they, they didn't do it. <laughs> they sent him to a, a good house, a, a reasonably busy house, but a good house. A lot of really good good guys. Mm -hmm. yeah, all that he still keeps in touch with. Yeah, is, he, is he still on the job, or is he retired, too? Is Ray retired? Your son. No, he's going to retire probably a couple, three, four months. Wow. I think he's got 30, 33. He'll have 34 years in when he retires. Sounds good to me, Roof, right? Get the hell we, out. Uh, that's my youngest son. That was after a fire we had in West Baltimore. He was at, he, I got him at 13 Engine when he got out of fire school. I got him at 13 Engine. I called downtown, and, and the guy pulled some strings for me, and he went to my old company at 13 Engine. He stayed there 26 years. Really? Yeah. In it was a business engine. company in Baltimore most of the time. He's He's out now? No, he's not out. He transferred out of after 26 years. He he got beat up really bad. He he that, he had had a broken collarbone, a broken kneecap, a broken ankle. Those was a dog years over there. I know. No, he he got beat up bad, and he had a chance to go from 6,000 runs to 3,000 runs at, a, at another engine company. Oh yeah. And uh, he called me up. Of course, I was retired. He called me up. He said, "I got a chance to go to 21 engine. What do you think I should do?" I said, "Man, you're 50 years old." You're all busted up. It's not going to get any easier. No. Nah. I think you ought to take it. Yeah. Uh, and then he called his, his brother, my oldest son, spent 20-some years at the busiest truck company, truck five on the east side. And uh, he got he, – he eventually transferred to a slow house after 28 years, I think. He called his brother up and said, what do you think I ought to do, man? I love 13 engine, but I got a chance to go to 21, cut my runs in there. Ray said – 
Don't be an idiot. Take it. <laughs> Take it. Help on that it. Was a, that was a couple years ago. So do they have do they have sons that are, are maybe looking to get on my, the job? My youngest son, Steve, has an 18 year old son, but he's not going to the fire department. He's he's a genius. And I mean, I, and I don't use that word lightly. He's, no, I got you. <laughs> he's, he's been accepted at 12 different colleges. Wow. It looks like he's going to go to Furman down in South Carolina for Good computer for science, computer science and computer. Uh, what is it? Cyber security. Cyber. Cyber security. Yeah. Who was that? Your producer in the back? <laughs> yeah. That's your boss, man. The boss. <laughs> Listen, That's your boss. We know about these technically challenged uh, yeah, guys. Yeah, you know. right. Boy, believe me. If, if you <laughs> called me up and, she, and I wasn't married to her, this wouldn't be going on. There's no way I could do this. How long are you guys married now? Uh, June will be 56 years. Woo! Yeah. God bless. Now he's got to get in. You're for you, Lois. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Never had a fight. That he won. <laughs> yeah. so November 10th, 1995. This is the biggest fire you ever went to. Yeah, that's that fire behind me. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, uh, that's the one that was scaring me before. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was vacant. The one burning is vacant. There it is. We got a little closer. But there you go. Woo! It, it yeah. spread, it spread to this one. And this one was occupied, and it burned that to the ground, it burned this to the ground. It burned another five-story building next to it to the ground. Mm. We couldn't put it out. It, I think uh, Warwick Avenue stopped it. It couldn't jump Warwick Avenue. And I think mean, we'd be able, we were there all night long, and uh, we came. We went home and came back night work and went back again bailing water in. I mean, it was eleven alarms. They was get, that they all can't heavy timber? It. Huh? Is that heavy heavy timber? All that stuff heavy timber? The inside, yeah. yeah. The inside, yeah. But they were old old buildings. The original fire building, the one that's burning that you can see, that was set by uh, uh, vagrants trying to keep it warm. Thank they, God they, for those big streets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, knew, they knew how to do it back in the 1800s. Yeah. Listen, we're going to put a big street here, a big street here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's what says, fighting fires with my sons. Is that the story you yeah, told? Uh, when Ray was, uh, Ray was an EVD, and at one time he was an 18 <clears throat> truck, which was not far from 10 truck. And uh, I had a fire with him and I'm on the third floor and I'm crawling down a hallway, got a mask on and there's, it's a long hallway and there's rooms on both sides. So I'm crawling down a hallway and I see a light at the other end of the hallway on a floor. I know it's gotta be another fireman. So I hollered down, I said, I'll get my right. I'll get the rooms on my right. You get the rooms on your right. So we cover them all. I hear, okay. And there's a pause and then I heard, Dad, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's great. I said, Yeah, Ray, that's me. <laughs> oh man, can you he imagine? Up, you ran up uh, getting hurt on that fire, tore his rotator cup, went off mm. duty for a long time. But it, it was neat to, to be crawling down towards him. Hell, it doesn't get better than that, man. Are you uh, kidding me? Dad, is that you? Dad, <laughs> Dad that's the <laughs> <password. laughs> My youngest son. I saw a lot of him because he was a 13 engine and I was a 10 truck and they were not that far apart. We were in different shifts, but if one of us was on overtime or got caught extra out or whatever, uh, we would see each other. But the first time I saw him, I'm up on a roof. It's a multiple alarm, not too far from his firehouse. I'm up on a roof, cutting a hole in a roof. And uh, I'm working my ass off because the roof's got 90 years of tar, of tar on it. And, uh, I, I glance at my aerial ladder and I can see it moving. I know somebody's coming up and I go back to work and, and I hear, Hey old man, you need some help. And I looked over and it's my youngest son. I said, no, yeah, that is cool, you man. got to work with both of them at a job. And then a oh, blessed man. Great. About that don't happen. Four hours later had a, had a dwelling fire and I'm at the top of the steps and he comes up the steps with a line and flops down right next to me. And, uh, he got water, and I, I crawled in behind him. He's hitting the fire. I'm I'm in behind him, and, and I'm searching it all. This is like movie stuff, bro. I don't think we've ever had a, we've and never then, had a guy on the show that says they actually not like that. Not that many not, times. Not like that. And then at that same night, four in the morning, get a fire right around the corner from Ten Truck on Carey Street. Goes to a second alarm, I believe. I'm not positive, but it, it was a it was a really really good working fire. And when it was over, 
I'm out front. There was my son again. And I looked at him. I said, you know, those first two fires, that was pretty cool. That was pretty unique. I said, but this shit's getting old now, man. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I was really proud to, to say that both my boys were really, really good firefighters. And you got to see him doing it. You were doing it yeah. with them. In fact, I had a I had an older veteran like me at the time say to me one day, talking about Ray, he said, let me tell you something. If I ever get trapped somewhere, that's who I want coming to get me. I thought, man, he, that's high praise right there, man. Oh, hell yeah. yeah. What else is that besides your reputation, right? Really? Yeah. <clears throat> Both good firemen. Steven, he was doing it. You got to play that one. Oh, he's up there doing it. Do I have that one? Steven, I have it. I don't know if I... I was doing it. I was up there doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Steven. <laughs> All right. So listen, this is like the pinnacle right here. So you, you finally get, uh, what is it? Rescuer of the year. You got to yeah, tell I, that Well, the, the, it was, I didn't. It was the companies that were on the fire. But it was uh, right around the corner from 10 truck. And Mike Prozier was tiller and I was driving. And Mike was, that's the guy they called the Energizer Bunny. He, he, good, good fireman, man. But we pull up. It's a, a large three story row home, row home. And there's a little girl sitting on the windowsill getting ready to jump. And I stop the truck and I'm, I get up on a turntable and I'm watching as they grab the 35. And they throw the 35 and it comes up short. And Mike goes up to the 35 and he can't reach her. And he gets up higher and higher until he's up on the next to last rung with his chest pushed up against the building and his arms are up like this. And he told me later, he said to her, "Hun, I know you're scared, but you got to let go. And she was maybe three feet above him and she let go. And when he caught her, he went back and I turned my head because I thought they were coming down and he threw his chest into the wall and stayed like that until he could get a hold of her and start down the ladder. Wow. And I threw the aerial ladder. I was supposed to ventilate the roof, but they were screaming. There were more kids inside. And I, I knew the 35 wasn't going to do him any good. So I threw the aerial ladder to the third floor and I went up I didn't have a mask on. And I went up and I'm crawling around <laughs> and I didn't find anybody right away. And Mike Brozier came up the aerial ladder with a mask on. And we're crawling around in the room and I heard him holler, I got one. And he said, go to the window. You don't have a mask. I'll, I'll, I'll hand him to you. And uh, I, I was hung up. My mask straps were hung up on something. I said, take him, take him out, take him out. I can't get to the window. And he got over to the window and I, I finally got unhooked. And we got out the window and we got the uh, got the baby down. And two other the two guys, my lieutenant, Jones from 10 Truck and this guy, Mike Fields, they went inside. They got two out. And somebody wow. in the back got somebody out. And I forget how many we rescued. I just, six, I think. Brought them all out. And uh, they all survived. Got them all out. And they all lived. Paramedics did a great job on them. And uh, the, the, the companies that were on the fire were nominated for Fire Rescue of the Year for Baltimore City. <clears throat> and we, we won that. And we were all honored at Towson University, black tie dinner, the governor, the mayor, everybody was there. It was uh, it was our 15 minutes of, of fame. It was pretty cool. It was nice to be recognized. Recognized, yeah, man. Well, well now you got two hours of fame on here, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I'll Ruffy, take you are a kid about this guy. I'll man. take the dinner. Right. I'll, take I'll, the, I'll take the dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see, black tie affair dinner. Uh, three idiots. Black tie affair. Three <laughs> idiots. <laughs> Black tie affair. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was it was quite a uh, quite a career. It was. I, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. That's pretty. Uh, listening to that that grab that 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 guy made on the ladder. Oh man, I'm telling you. That's legit, man. That was, that was, that was a ballsy thing. If anybody's ever been on a ladder that doesn't reach the window, been up, they know. They know that's scary shit, yeah, man. I'm up two stories, cleaning my gutters out. I'm like, whoa, what the fuck? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm saying, if you're rung. standing on the last rung yeah. and you ain't you ain't at the window, that ain't no joke. No, no. You talking about cleaning, catch about cleaning your arms? Talk about cleaning your gutter out. After I'd been retired for ten years, <clears throat> I was 64 years old, and every year I'd been up on my roof, walking along the edge with a leaf blower, blowing the 
got leaves out of the gutters. I'm 64 years old. I got up there and I went, whoa, I could fall off of here. <laughs> <laughs> I got to keep waking up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we moved to a condo. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Now yeah. they mow my lawn. I got to collect my pension for a while. Shit. Lois is going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so then I retired. <laughs> I retired in 2001. Oh, wait, we missed one story. The lucky lockets. Oh, yeah. We were lucky. The whole family was lucky. They had a really bad fire on the east side. And a guy from 13 engine, the, the, the floors collapsed. They were thrown into the basement, burned. The guy from 13 engine got burned, but my youngest son was off. The guy from five truck got trapped. My oldest son was off. And 10 truck, Mike Prozier, was the first one down in the basement to try and uh, drag him out. And uh, all three of us were off duty at that time. Because that, that could have been that could have been real bad. Could have been real bad for us. But it wasn't. Time. And, and they always call my oldest son Lucky Lockett. I mean, I mean, he, he, no matter what happens to him, he, he comes out on a good side. You're muted, Coop. <laughs> so put that, you got that picture of me and my boys when we retired? Yes, I was waiting to bring it up. That's it, yeah. Wow. That was my last night, last night in the fire department. And they got permission to come over and ride with me. Wow, that, but you didn't catch I had a fire my next to last night. I wanted a fire my last night so bad. I guess I should have paid somebody to go out and set one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you got the pike axe. That's, you know, that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> We could have hired Mike uh, Cologne to go out and do something, set a couple of fires out there or something. I don't know. You know him. He's itching. What? Yeah, he's itching. He wants the tones to drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We had a bunch of runs, but we didn't have any fires. That's all right, man. You got That's to work with them anyway, though, both of them, which is unheard. I don't think we've ever had anybody on the show that actually got to work, go to work, work with them. Like, like legit work, right? They yeah. usually have like yeah. a little BS job or something, but to have, you know, you crawling down a hall and then they, the other guy coming the other way is your kid. That's, uh, yeah. that's fucking hilarious, well, man. I got to say, you were right, yeah. man. This guy is the guy. This guy. The goat. The goat. Goat. That's oh, what they man. said. Lago, Kobo. <laughs> Said, go, right. though, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, stand by. We got because we're behind. We got to play uh, commercials. Let's play okay. the. Uh, what do we go? Let's do Usden, and then you get your old school tip when he does his thing, right? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Let's okay, Here we go. Come get your autographed copy of They Saved New York at this year's FDIC 2024 at the Getting Salty booth. This the nation's premier fire conference, and photographer Glenn Usden will be there, and he'll autograph your book at the aforementioned Getting Salty booth during exhibit hours on both Thursday and Friday, April 18th and 19th, respectively. Each book will come with a limited edition 16 by 20 color poster that is suitable for framing. And this limited edition coffee table book features the compelling stories of 90 FDNY firefighters and is almost 300 pages packed with action photos from the 1970s all the way up to today's FDNY fire operations. Read the personal stories of the men and women who fought the Warriors fires, the World Trade Center, and Black Sunday tragedies, and almost every major incident in the last 50 years of the FDNY. Come see us at the Getting Salty booth in the hallway outside the main exhibit area, Thursday and Friday of FDIC week, April 18th and 19th, 2024. And if you get there early enough, Louie and I will not be bagged up. We will not, not be in the cups yet. Get there early, and we won't be in the cups. Oh, I don't know about that. But... Yeah, I don't know about that. That's a drink-a-thon. But, all right. You know what time it is, though? I don't know. What time, what is, time it? is it? Oh, what time is it? What time oh, is it? it's it is time, time for... for... The old, the old school tip, tip of, of the, the day. Day, day, day. All right, Ray, take it away, kid. If, if I was going to talk to the rookies nowadays... I would tell them that there's a time for play. There's a time for laughing, but there's a time for work. And don't get the two confused because work is serious. You can lose your life. Somebody else from a civilian can lose their life. You've got to listen to the old guys. What you learn in fire school is nothing compared to what the, the old guys in your companies can tell you what to do, when to do it, or when not to do it. It's fun. It's a lot of laughs. The kitchen's always fun. But when that gong goes off, you better take it serious because it's no joke. You can get hurt or killed very easily out there. Excellent. Excellent. Great, Great career, brother. Great stories, man. I love guys that can tell stories. Good and stuff. he lived it. He was doing it, Stephen. 
Can I can I tell you something about my youngest son real quick? Absolutely. After he had been in less than a year, maybe a year, um, the Discovery Channel made a documentary called Streets of Fire. And it was shown in Europe and then it was shown in the United States. And they featured 13 engine and they featured his shift and they featured him a lot because he was a rookie. He come in in 95. This was either 95 or 96. And it's it's still on YouTube. I was you bring up see it on fire, YouTube? Because I'm going to go watch it now. And you'll see him. He's the youngest. He looks like he's 12. <laughs> <laughs> What's it called? Streets of Fire? Streets of Fire. Oh, we got to talk about the book quick, too. Yep. Oh, yeah. We're say the oh, book yeah, the book. The book. And we got to FRC. Yeah, when, when, when I had been retired, let's see, 2015, four or five years, I decided to write, I wasn't writing a book. I wanted to write the memoirs for my grandkids to read when they got older. And my mother had kept scrapbooks. She kept four scrapbooks of all newspaper articles of fires that I was on. And then when she passed, I was still in the fire department and I kept the fifth scrapbook for my, up until I retired. And when I decided to write my memoirs, I just opened that first scrapbook and there was a little article in there about my first fire. Wow. And you know, you always remember your first fire. And it brings back a lot of memories. I didn't even know how to turn on a computer. My wife's a secretary. She turns on the computer, brings up Word. So I just sit there. Like hunting this. And pecking, hunting and pecking. Hunting. Yeah, it's it. Just like that. Hunting and pecking. Hunting and pecking. And uh, I did that for about a year off and on. So I, I get in a roll for hours. And then I wouldn't do anything for days. And then I'd get on a roll again and I'd do it. And when I got it. When I got it all done and she printed it all out and I gave it to her, I said, what do you think? She's looking through it. She said, you know what you got here? I said, what? She said, you got a 260 page paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I'll take care of that for you. Oh, uh, what a good woman. But it wasn't a book. It was memoirs. And then my son Ray took it to work. And uh, a guy at his firehouse said, tell your son to put it on a disc. Or your father to put it on a disc. I got a friend of mine. He's an independent publisher. I wanted to look at it. So I told my wife, put this on a disc. And uh, he took it to this guy and he sent it to his partner. It was a woman in Denver, Colorado. And they emailed me and said, we want to make it a book. I was like, are you kidding me? There you go. Into the there heat. it is. Ray Lockett. Into the heat. And uh, Where we find the stories that? I was telling on here, they're all in there. And uh, I couldn't believe it. I told him, I said, look, I can't put thousands of dollars up to get this thing started. They said, no, we only we only publish first time authors. And you don't have to put any money up front and uh, we'll edit it. And you can give us the pictures you want in it. And uh, that's what they did. And I couldn't when, I, when we got the book at home, they wanted to check. But first they edited. They wanted to change everything that I said the way because I said I just wrote it the way I talk. Right. And uh, I said, they kept sending, I'd send them two chapters. They edited it, scratch this, scratch that. I'd say, as I had final say, I'd say, no, 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 no. Send it back. Finally, they said, why won't you let us change anything? I said, because if I let you read it, change it the way it reads, people that know me are going to read this and say, he didn't write, he didn't write that. Yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. So I left it the way it was. 90% of it was the way it was. Good. And you and know what? Private will get that. And I got will understand that. And I, I, they said, how much you want to sell it for? I said, 10 bucks. They said, $10. I said, great. You can sell this for $20 a copy. I said, I'm selling a fireman. I don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> and they're cheap. I sold it for cheap. 10 bucks. <laughs> and I sold uh, 3,000 copies. Wow. And uh, I took $1,000 and donated it to the Widows and Orphans Fund for my union. And I had a couple grand left over. I put down towards a new car. And my publisher went out of business. I couldn't get any more books. And um, now the only way you can get it now is on Kindle, on Amazon. I don't, I, I don't have any more books. So any publishers out there hear this, then you want to get that book going again. Yeah. Reach out to Ray Lockett. Yeah, I mean... I, we, we tried to figure out how to get it back. My wife was pretty good at it, but we couldn't get it it's the way it was originally. Mm. The cover, the same cover and everything. All right, all right. So, but I, I'm fine with it. I didn't write it as a book, and I didn't sell it to retire to Boca Raton. Mm. You know, I, was, I was happy with it. The Boca Vista. 
Yeah. Book of history. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> book of history. <laughs> <laughs> so good for uh, you, Ray. You did a great job, man. You did a great job with your sons. You did a great job on uh, with your career. But staying married for 56 years, God bless you. And for yeah, your and everything you did. Your career. That's it. Just Amazing. keep – now you just got to keep uh, – you know, don't be fluffing Breathing the ball in. up now. You know, no, don't be fluffing. He plays golf a lot now, Kobe. Could be fluffing the ball oh, up. Don't be fluffing big, it up now. Oh, he's a big golfer <laughs> now, huh? How about a fresco? Mm -hmm. Not me, sir. But if I kill all golfers, they're gonna lock me up and throw away the Hit key. Hit him straight, man. Hit him straight. <laughs> well, uh, right, let's play the uh, old school health and safety tip, guys, really quick. Yes. The First Responders Center for Excellence is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to protecting the lives and livelihoods of first responders. Their education and research initiatives aim to bring greater awareness and understanding the challenges to the health, safety, and well-being of firefighters, EMS personnel and other first responders too. They are an affiliate of the National Fallen Firefighter Foundation. And tonight's old school health and safety tip is regularly wash the inside liner of the helmet. Maintaining the clean helmet removes harmful contaminants to minimize your risk of skin cancer and precancerous cells on your four or five head. Whatever you have. I don't know. That's it. That's all I got. But we uh, would be remiss if we did not talk about the New York City police officer that was murdered in the line of duty. Gone to pull out up, please. Yep, Officer Jonathan E. Diller on a traffic stop, no left man. Unbelievable. Yeah. Dirt bag who had 21 counts priors before that. So I heard that uh, the Barstool guys raised they did, yep, 750,000 and then they matched it. So they got 1.5 million for the family. And then I also heard that the the Stephen Siller, uh, the Tunnel to Towers, Stephen Siller Foundation, uh, paid off paid his off mortgage. The mortgage. Yeah. So, yeah. so again, that doesn't doesn't bring the guy back, but maybe yeah. just makes it a little bit easier, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Let's say our prayers. We're going to ring the five bells. Line of duty death. Rest in peace, brother. Yeah, rest in peace, brother. And God and prayers for his family and and his coworkers. Yeah, got a baby, boy, yeah, yeah. one year old. One year old. Yeah, it's terrible. Oh man. All right, so Ray, thank you so much. Stay around to, uh, so we uh, can talk to you on the after show. Don't forget, big show Monday night. Big reveal. Big. It's big roof. I don't it's even. Gonna be, huge. It's gonna be huge. It's gonna be huge. It's gonna be huge. It's a huge bitch. Yep. Uh, that's it. So until Monday, ladies and gentlemen. Pull up your boots because it looks like work. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> we'll, see you, we'll see you at the big one, Ray. Yeah, he's good. Sounds good. Uh, all right. Saddle up. Sounds like work. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good night, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>